Hi, my name is Pastor Daniel. I'm so excited you're taking an opportunity to watch this sermon. We believe that any time we open the Word of God, that we have an opportunity to be changed because the Bible is the actual live Word of our Heavenly Father. And we hope that this impacts you in a positive way. A quick word of caution, and that is that this sermon that you're about to watch is by no means uh, the church. It's not a substitute for a church. It's not a substitute for a pastor in your life. The church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, a group of believers doing life together, worshiping and pursuing Jesus together. In no way should this be any sort of primary discipleship in your life, and in no way should this replace the pastor that somewhere God has called to shepherd you. We hope sincerely that you're part of a local church somewhere. And if you're not, I wanna encourage you to go find a local church to be part of, because for all of the ups and downs and messiness of the local church, the Bible calls it the bride of Christ. It is the hope of the world. And you need to be part of one because it'll help. If you don't know where or how to find a local church, we'd love to help. You can simply go to our website and email us at hello at resurrect.church and we'll do our best to plug you in. We appreciate your time. We hope that this supplementary discipleship impacts you in a positive way. We believe the Bible has a profound impact on us when we allow God to speak to us. Thanks. Good morning, Resurrection Church. My name is Nathan Mayer. I'm the youngest elder here at Res, and it's my honor to bring the word to you this morning. Uh, I'm going to start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for Jesus, our King who died so that we might be with him. Um, Thank you for your spirit that you've put within us that transforms and changes us. And thank you for the church where we get to work out these realities in our own messy ways in a community of people who love us and care for us. Pray that you would bless our time this morning as we open your word, that you would speak and that we would hear. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know how your morning is going, but this morning as I was waving to Brenda Wood, uh, I walked right into a pole. I was looking this way and walking this way and just smack right into the, the pole outside there in the breezeway. So I hope your morning is going a little better than that. No, no surprise, pole encounters. Uh, I'm not supposed to be up here. I'm not supposed to be up here, not just because I'm the kind of guy that walks into poles while I'm saying hi to people, <laughs> but because I was raised as an atheist and I spent a lot of my years arguing with Christians, trying to pull them away from the faith. Uh, I've, I've experienced demonic oppression and uh, felt desires in my heart that I didn't think the basest, most evil human could experience and desire. And uh, there's, there's no reason why God should choose a person like me to be sharing the word with you this morning. But isn't that just the way that our God chooses to work? Doesn't he choose to take people who are small or insignificant, who are lowly or even wicked and redeem them and use them for his purposes and for his glory? There's nothing about David or Samson or Abraham or even Moses, any of these guys that we've talked about that should really impress us, except for the fact that God chose to take them and to use them for his glory. So we're going to be talking about one of our... um, maybe more obvious examples of that truth, everybody's favorite prostitute, Rahab. Um, I know you all have a a list, you know, your favorite prostitutes. She's got to be at the top of the list. Um, Rahab is a wonderful example of faith and obviously is an unlikely hero for us to be discussing, but I'm so excited that I get to share this story because I, I admire her and I find her such an encouraging model of what it looks like to be called out of a life that we once lived and into something new that Jesus is creating. 
So we're going to briefly look at Hebrews chapter 11, and then we're going to spend most of our time in Joshua chapter 2. So if you want to just turn to Joshua chapter 2, that's probably the safer place to start. But I'll go ahead and read our passage. Hebrews 11, 30 through 31 says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So last week, we talked about the faith of Moses, a pillar of the faith, if you will. I mean, this guy was used by God to deliver the law to the people, to basically single-handedly defeat the greatest army and nation known to man, who um, led a really stubborn and obstinate people through the wilderness for 40 years, right up to the border of the promised land and prepared for them to go in. By contrast, Rahab, she can seem kind of small, kind of insignificant, but the Bible does not hold back in how it honors this woman and her faith. So I'm so excited that we get to talk about that. We want to learn from Rahab's example in three key ways, three key ways. First, we're going to learn that faith believes that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he's going to do. Second, faith leads us out of the life we knew. And finally, faith calls us into a new kingdom. We're going to dive right in with Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Oh, BT dubs, this is story time. So you can find your little dot on the ground around the librarian. And I don't have any pictures for you, but just have your imagination caps on because we're going to be reading about a chapter. And it's a great story. Um, the Bible chooses to communicate in stories for a reason because we actually learn better that way. So anyway, Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you'll overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. So Rahab totally plays these guys. And uh, in case you've ever wondered if lying can sometimes please God, yes, you know, uh, obviously in this instance, a prostitute and her lies pleased God. So we can recognize that life isn't always in black and white. Rahab is a pretty unlikely hero, right? First of all, Rahab is a prostitute, which uh, many teachers and writers over the course of Christian history have tried to kind of clean up or make it neater and tidier. But the New Testament, like some of them would call her a, a hotel keeper or a, an innkeeper, right? But the Bible doesn't have any qualms about just telling it like it is. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament clearly identify her as a prostitute. And uh, the fact that she is a, a sex worker. The Bible doesn't like identify her by that. It's not this limiting thing like, oh, that's all she is. That's the most important thing. It doesn't tell the story of Rahab the prostitute and everything has to do with her being a prostitute. She just happens to be a prostitute who also chooses to be faithful and obey God and glorify him despite the fact that some, of, some aspects of her lifestyle are against God's ways and God's laws. So uh, also, Rahab, she's not just a prostitute, but she's also a Canaanite and a resident of the city of Jericho, which was one of the strongholds in the land. Now, I don't know if you remember the Canaanites from Sunday school, but the Israelites and the Canaanites have basically never gotten along for all of human history. And so the Canaanites were the perennial enemy of the Israelites. And furthermore, as a citizen of Jericho, which is pretty close to the Jordan River, they were the number one target of the Israelites for when they were going to cross over the Jordan to take the land. So basically, 
Rahab has every reason not to like these guys. She has every reason to turn them in, to hand them over. But instead, as we saw, she protects them. She lies for them. She puts her own neck out on the line to protect these two Israelites who are spies for an enemy nation coming to conquer them. That's pretty amazing. We'll find out why. Rahab might be an unlikely hero, but you and I are unlikely heroes too. Uh, None of us can look at where we're sitting today if we've been redeemed and say, oh yeah, I did this. I brought myself here. My own works, my efforts, my, my time, my investment. I'm why I am the person I am today. If, if you've been redeemed, if you've been bought by Christ, then none of us have a single thing to claim for ourselves. We have to say everything good in my life <laughs> was Christ. Uh, the only thing I ever contributed was the bad stuff, the junk, the baggage. Jesus has done everything good in my life, given me every blessing I have. So we're going to continue our story, Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 and find out why Rahab chooses to protect these spies. Rahab is speaking here. Before the men lay down, she came to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Amen. Rahab, she's heard of what God did when he parted the Red Sea and destroyed Israel's enemies in the desert, right? Like they didn't have Twitter back then, But news still got around. There was about 40 years of time between when the Israelites left Egypt until now. And so if God chooses to part a sea and lets a nation walk through on dry land, that news is eventually going to get around. You know, that's kind of a big deal. And so Rahab heard of the power of the God of the Israelites. She also heard about how he defeated Egypt and, and their Pharaoh and defeated the kings in the desert who... Rahab would have known and probably been scared of these kings, Og and, um, and Sihon. They would have been bad dudes, people that she would have been intimidated or frightened by. Um, she heard how Israel defeated those great kings. And so she knows that God is able to do these things. And she believed that God is who he says he is, that he's God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, and able to do anything he desires. If he chooses to lift you up, you'll be lifted up. If he chooses to bring you down, you'll be brought down. And nobody on earth can stand against him. None of us can stand up to God. None of us can um, change his mind. If he desires to accomplish something, it's, it's going to be done. So Rahab, she believed this. She recognized that God, the God of the Israelites, is who he says he is. And so she was afraid, and rightly so, right? Because like Isaiah declared, she was a woman of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips, just like you and I. Uh, Her people were against the God she now believed in. They were guilty of worshiping idols that, uh, you know, an idol for the, the weather and an idol for fertility and an idol for prosperity and for the harvest, Uh, God's for everything, but no one true God who deserved glory above all the rest. They were guilty of child sacrifice, sacrificing their children on the altars of their gods to try to procure favor or influence or power to try to manipulate their genie gods into doing what they wanted. And they were also guilty of the perversion of justice. Corruption ran rampant. People would abuse one another and uh, take whatever power they had access to and use it to, to take and take and take until there was nothing left. The Bible actually says that God gave this country, the land of Canaan, 400 years of storing up iniquity, of storing up injustice, to justify the conquest of the Israelites over the land of Canaan. So basically, 
God is about to punish them for 400 years of immorality, injustice, cruelty, and idol worship. And so Rahab reasonably is scared, right? She feared not that God was some tyrant who was going to come and beat her with a a rod, but feared a just king who is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, who has a responsibility to judge justly. And she knew that her and her people were not going to be acquitted in that judgment. What you and I believe about God matters. Just like Rahab, we have every reason to fear God. You and I, we can't say that we are above injustice. Uh, We might not have lied in court or taken a bribe or given a bribe. But when it benefits us, we can all think of many instances where we've done uh, the wrong thing, where we've treated people unfairly, where we've taken advantage because it profited us or because it was easier, because it was comfortable or because it made us more popular. We are all an unjust people and we live in an unjust world, an unjust nation. Um, We're still guilty of idol worship. You and I, we worship our, our careers, our children, our money, our comfort, whatever it is. We're still idol worshipers. Our hearts are little idol factories that just create gods to worship because we don't have statues out here to praise. We like things that we can see and touch and hold, and we like things that we can control. And so we're all still idol worshipers. And so what we believe about God matters. We should fear God because he's still a just God today, amen? Just because we have uh, decided to come to church on a Sunday morning doesn't spare us from God's justice, from his judgment, right? Uh, What what building you choose to sit in on a Sunday morning in no way spares us from having to stand before the throne of God one day and give an account. And so we should fear God, again, not as some tyrant who's gonna hit us over the head with a cudgel, but as a just king who sees every thought, who knows every feeling, every desire, every action, and is going to judge justly and fairly and righteously. Do we fear God? Do we believe he is who he says he is and that he'll do what he says he's going to do? Let's see how Rahab responds to this belief, this faith that she has. Joshua 2, 12 through 21. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I've dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills so the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into this land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down and you shall gather into your house, your father and your mother, your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors or your house into the street, His blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we will be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your word, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. So Rahab, in case you didn't just catch that, just committed treason. If we had, if this was back in the 70s and the Soviet Union was still uh, in power and a few Russian spies come to stay at your house and they uh, are being looked for by the FBI and you just tell the FBI, oh, no, 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 uh, they, they went somewhere else. They're not here. And then you send the Russian spies back to their country so they can report on all of your weaknesses. That's, that's probably treason, right? Um, Rahab is sticking her neck out in a big way right now. Because while being accused of treason is a big deal today, back then, they would have probably just tortured you to death in the most creative way possible, and then done the the same to your family and friends as well. So 
Rahab, she betrays her own people. She betrays their own people to death to protect the spies because of her faith in the God that those spies served. In the same way, Noah, when he built the ark, he condemned the whole world to destruction because by being faithful to do that and to go into the ark, he showed that any of them could have trusted in God too, but chose not to. Oftentimes when God calls us out of something, whatever we're called out of, he is judging, he's condemning that thing. Rahab, by helping the spies, showed that any one of the citizens of Jericho could have done the same thing. They all could have repented. They all could have given themselves up to the Israelites or packed their bags and left. But instead, they chose to stay and to fight against the will of God who was giving the land to the people of Israel. So Rahab, she betrays her own people. She's a traitor in every sense of the word. But in doing so, she secures the salvation of herself and of her family at great risk. Now, you might think, okay, this is a pretty reasonable play, right? Like, uh, she knows that the town of Jericho is going down and she's just trying to save her own bacon. I don't see anything particularly noble about that. But even believing that the Israelites were going to win this battle was an act of faith. Like, I don't know if you know what kind of gear the Israelites were carrying through the desert for 40 years, but it was probably a lot more like sticks, stones, and spears than it was like, you know, siege machines that could knock walls down. The town of Jericho was surrounded by a great wall. They probably had archers and other uh, defensive mechanisms. And so if you have a bunch of people with sticks, stones, and spears coming against a big city with big walls, and everyone on top of the wall has bows and arrows. It's actually like, that's not a great plan, not a great battle strategy. So Rahab, she wasn't trusting that the Israelites could win this battle. She knew that the same God who defeated the king of Egypt, who defeated Og and Bashan, the same God who can part the Red Seas, if he wants to give my city over to the Israelites, there's nothing I can do to stop him. And so her act was actually an act of faith, believing that the God she follows is going to win this battle, win this war. Just like Rahab betrayed her own people for the sake of her faith in God, God calls you and I out of the lives we once lived and the loyalties we once held. Now, you and I probably aren't going to be called to commit treason, although Christians at different times in history have had to uh, commit treason, to do treasonous acts in order to protect their faith. Bonhoeffer is a good example. He was a German citizen during World War II, and the church had very much bought into the Nazism of the day. He was in England at the time, but he actually returned to his home country to both encourage the church to stand up against Nazism in Germany and also to basically conspire to assassinate Hitler and eventually was hung for treason as a traitor. So there might be times where you're called to actually commit treason, but what I can say is each one of you, each one of us is called to lay down the loyalties, the communities, the identities that we once held before we were found in Jesus. So what that looks like is um, you and I, we're not, we're not called to be citizens of any earthly country, any earthly kingdom, uh, any earthly party or principality or power. Uh, you don't owe any loyalty to um, any system in this world, any government in this world, because you've been bought by a king who reigns in heaven and doesn't want to share his authority with any other power that you want to give your loyalty to. Peter sums it up this way. Um, he says in 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So he's talking to Christians and uh, they're living probably in the same town or city that they've lived in their whole lives. And he's calling them sojourners and exiles. This isn't your home. This isn't where you belong. Whether you're in Rome or Jerusalem or New York or Bakersfield, this isn't your home. 
This is just the land of your exile, the land of your pilgrimage, the land of your sojourn. And so uh, our home, it's actually kept for us in heaven. And everything we work for, everything we invest in, everything we do, it should be about that heavenly kingdom, not about building any kingdoms here on earth. A good illustration of how we struggle with this, though, is in my daughter. She's three years old, so it's okay for her to think this way. It's actually kind of cute. Um, we like to talk to my daughter about what heaven is like because we want her to be excited about Jesus coming back. We want her to be excited about the idea of heaven. But no matter how good we make it sound, she still says, but I don't want to go to heaven because I'd miss my home. And it's, I go, ah, you know, but many adults have the exact same perspective if we're honest, right? Uh, like, you know, I, I get that heaven sounds nice, but I have to die to get there or, or Jesus has to come back. And I kind of like what I got going on right now. You know, I like my crew, whoever that crew is. I like my uh, friends and family. I like my job. Um, I'm doing pretty well for myself. I don't know. Maybe Jesus, you can just put it off a few years. Like maybe, maybe wait until I'm retired to return. Or um, my, my wife, she really likes being married to me for some reason. And... Uh, <laughs> We've been married for five years, but we're totally still in the honeymoon phase. And so uh, when I ask her about her desire to uh, go to heaven, her desire to have Jesus return, sometimes she's a little unsure, you know, because we won't technically be married in heaven. We'll be closer than we've ever been, but we won't be husband and wife anymore in heaven. And that makes her a little sad. So sometimes she's okay with Jesus returning tomorrow, but sometimes she'd rather have him return, you know, in 20 years when we get tired of each other. And uh, uh, then, then Jesus can come back, you know? Uh, our loyalty to anything on this earth, whether it's a kingdom, a party, a power, a principality, those things, they distract us from our loyalty to God. Even marriage, as much as I like being married, Paul actually wa- would rather have all of us be single if that's our gift, because then we would be able to have undivided loyalty to God and to his purposes and to his work, right? So um, Jesus, he's interested in securing your undivided loyalty. He doesn't want you to be um, a Republican or a Democrat who's also a Christian. He doesn't want you to be an American or a Mexican or a uh, Chinese person who's also a Christian. He wants you to be a Christian, And then everything else is a a distant second place to your loyalty, affection, and focus on his will, his desires, his mission. Those earthly uh, things that seem so important to us now, do you think they're really going to matter when we're sitting there for all eternity and glory? Do you really think it's going to matter what your 401k number looked like or what... um, what your friends thought of you? Do you think it's going to matter whether you, your sports team won this year or next year or uh, never won at all? None of those things are going to be significant in eternity. Even, even the things that we think are really important, like the direction of our country or the, uh, the world that our children grew up in, Jesus isn't nearly as concerned about those things as he is about your affection and loyalty for his kingdom and building his new country, his new nation here on earth. So that sounds like some bad news, right? Jesus is calling out of, calling us out of a lot of things. He's asking us to give up a lot. If if we're honest, he asks us to sacrifice everything, to lay our lives down. He even says to hate our mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters, and even our own lives, if we want to be his disciples, we have to lay everything down. But he doesn't do that so he can take from us. He does that so he can give to us. He has something new and better to offer us. We're going to learn from Rahab's example in Joshua chapter 6. So we're skipping a few chapters, verses 21 through 25. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her, as he swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it. 
only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So Rahab, she, she doesn't seem all that important in the, the scope of her own life. She probably never thought of herself as a particularly significant individual, right? She was probably a person of dishonor and disrepute in her own communities, not somebody who really mattered, not somebody whose story would be recorded in the Bible for all of eternity. But the New Testament honors Rahab. It honors her for her faith and for her obedience. Matthew actually includes her as one of the four women in Jesus's genealogy, identifying Rahab as the mother of Boaz. So uh, Rahab, a prostitute and a Canaanite, is actually included in the most significant lineage in all of human history, the lineage of the son of God wrapped in flesh. Forever, Jesus will be a descendant of this Canaanite prostitute who trusted God and acted on it. The author of Hebrews also includes her among the great examples of faith because she welcomed the spies like we just read. And then finally, the letter of James offers Rahab as an example of faith and action combined. James 2.25 asks, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? So in the pages of the New Testament, Rahab has secured honor and glory and salvation for herself by trusting in God by faith. And if I'm honest, really, that's all God is asking of you and I as well. He's asking us to trust him by faith. But the scary part about that is, just like James mentioned, uh, faith isn't just an idea. It's not just an attitude. Inevitably, faith results in action. If we believe God is who he says he is and does what he says he'll do, then we're going to act on that faith. If I believe that there's an invisible platform here, while I'm preaching, I'm not going to hesitate to just take a step out and uh, hopefully not eat it down the stairs as I, as I step out in faith, believing this invisible platform exists, right? Rahab trusted God and acted on it. In the same way, you and I are called not just out of our old lives, but into a new kingdom, into a new creation. Just as Rahab was called to be a part of Israel's kingdom and community, you and I are also called into a new kingdom with a new king, a new law, and a new community. I don't know if y'all know this, but Jesus is king today, right? Jesus isn't king in some like weird theoretical abstract sense, like where um, he's theologically in charge of, you know, everything that happens, but he's king in the I'm in charge and you better do what I tell you sense <laughs> where um, really our opinion doesn't matter a whole lot when we decide what we want to obey and what we don't want to obey. The only person whose opinion matters is the king's. And just like you would be a little nervous in the presence of a king who uh, is perfectly just and righteous, we should be a little nervous in the presence of Jesus. He's, a, he's kind and loving and gentle and lowly, but he's also just and powerful, and he is the Lord of all. So Jesus is king, and he's reigning and ruling at God's right hand, and he himself invites you to believe that he is who he says he is, to walk out of the life you knew, and to come into a new kingdom. And you and I, we're actually bound to follow a new law, a new law. Now that sounds kind of intimidating because the whole idea of grace is that Jesus already accomplished everything for us. I can't contribute a, a dang thing to my salvation. But if I really have the Holy Spirit in me, and if I really love this Jesus who I claim to serve, then I'm going to live out the life that he's called me to, the life that he's asked me to lead. And this new love, or sorry, this new law it's not like any law you've ever known. We're bound to love and to forgive. We're bound to do justice and to be humble. We're bound to love and follow our king, not just in outward actions, but from the heart as renewed people by the power of his Holy Spirit within us. And then finally, you and I, we have a new community, a new community, a new citizenship. We're citizens of heaven and we're patriots, 
We want to be patriots, though, not for an earthly flag or for an earthly kingdom, but for a heavenly kingdom. And that, that might sound kind of weird because sometimes patriotism gets, uh, well, it's, it's a complicated subject. But I want you to be full on like American flag hat, American flag shirt, American flag pants, and American flag shoes, like that level of patriotism, but for your heavenly citizenship, for the king that you serve and follow, and for the brothers and sisters in Christ you have in this new country, this new nation, this new kingdom. Um, we're called to be patriots whose loyalty to our king is unshakable and whose love for our brothers and sisters would lead us to serve, suffer, and even die for one another. I think the reason we like war movies so much isn't because we really like watching people get shot to death over and over and over again. It's because we find the camaraderie and brotherhood of the characters that are fighting alongside each other very attractive. Uh, all of these people from diverse backgrounds and uh, who sometimes don't even like each other very much, being willing to suffer and even die for one another's sake in their uh, working towards a common goal, a common aim. We're supposed to have that same bond of brotherhood, that same camaraderie together, because you and I were fellow citizens and soldiers in that same kingdom. And so uh, when I talk about being willing to serve, suffer, and even die for one another, I'm not exaggerating. Just like those soldiers in the trenches are called to serve, suffer, and die for one another, so you and I, as a family and as a new citizenship, are called to serve, suffer, and die for one another. And that might seem foreign and far away, but if the Holy Spirit that dwells in you is real, then that Holy Spirit in you will love the Holy Spirit at work in the people around you. And if we claim to love God, the Bible says, if we can't even love the people who are sitting next to us in the pew, any words I have about how much I love God are bogus. They're just made up. Because if we can't love the person sitting next to us who I can see, how can I possibly love a eternal God who I can't see or touch or feel, right? Our love for one another should be remarkable. It should be uh, distinct. It should be something that makes the whole world look at us and go, huh, wow, that's different. And we'll still be weird and we'll still annoy each other. And sometimes we won't even like each other. But regardless of all of those things, we should love each other. Even if the only thing we have in common is the gospel, even if the only thing we have in common is the spirit of God at work in us, that's enough. We don't have to get along all the time. We don't have to think the same way or act the same way. We don't have to have the same traditions or culture. But we do have to love one another because of the bond we have in the spirit as citizens of a new kingdom. So what does that mean? We've learned about how faith believes God is who he says he is, that faith calls us out of the life we once lived, and that faith calls us into a new kingdom. But what are you actually supposed to go do with that? My, my desire for you, my heart for you, is I want you to trust that King Jesus himself is able to save and reconcile you because he himself suffered and died for you on the cross. See, the king that we serve, he lived out his command to serve others. He lived out his command that the greatest must serve the least because the greatest of any of us, King Jesus, he himself suffered and died for you and I, that he might win us, that he might buy us back, that he might save us. And so when he suffered on the cross and bore the sins that I've committed in my life, he made a place for me in his new kingdom. He made a place for me in heaven forever. And there's nothing that I can do to win my place there. Only Jesus can invite me and only Jesus can save me. Only Jesus can bring me into that new kingdom community. And so uh, my desire is for you to trust in him. Put your faith in this king. We can commit to turning away from lives of selfishness and corruption, godless living, and turn to the living God who will put his spirit in us and make us new creatures, new creations. You and I, we weren't meant to live as just bodies, just flesh. We were always meant to have the spirit of God in us. We were always meant to be empowered, to be filled up by God himself. 
vessels for his will, vessels for his power and authority. And so when we live for ourselves, when we, when we do uh, selfish and gross and um, we'll live, live out the lusts and passions of our flesh, basically, when I do what I want to do, I don't bring glory to God and I don't live out the life that God desires for me. So we can turn away from those things. We can become new creations by the power of the spirit at work within us. And in doing so, finally have the power to be the kind of people that we always wanted to be, to love one another from a pure heart, to actually care about other people, to not manipulate or lie anymore, but to to do the right thing, to be humble, to serve others. And then finally, uh, if you feel like the church is this weird thing that you do on Sunday mornings because Jesus told you to, we're doing it wrong, right? Uh, church shouldn't be this weird thing you do once a week because you want to obey Jesus. Church should be the very foundation of our pursuit of Jesus Christ. We were always meant to pursue Jesus together. We were always meant to serve Jesus together. Just like you can't have a nation where everybody is just off doing their own thing and never actually working together. So you can't have a new kingdom, a church, where everybody is off doing their own things, working on their own. We were always meant to be a part of a community. If you feel disconnected and detached, find a way to get plugged in. Find a way to build that community. And if if you don't see it being possible, then let's change it. Let's pull up the whole system and start fresh if that's what it takes for us to love one another as Jesus has commanded us to. So as we close, I'd like to invite you to trust in this Jesus. Um, Sometimes we can have these weird ideas about what it means to be a Christian, but at the end of the day, Jesus has called himself a king. We can either choose to believe him or not. Um, and he's invited us to be a part of his kingdom. And we can either accept that invitation or reject it. And when we accept it, when we accept that invitation, he makes us new people. I'd like to invite you, if you haven't made that decision, to become a new creation today. He says that if we ask for forgiveness, we'll receive it. If we trust in him for salvation, we'll find it. Jesus, he's, he's not a tyrant who's waiting to beat you over the head for all the things you've done wrong. He's gentle and lowly, and he's compassionate, and he loves us. And so I'd invite you to come and find forgiveness because I want you to be part of this new kingdom too. I want you to be praising God in heaven with me for all of eternity. And I want to be able to join with you in the work, that, the real work that we have to do to build God's kingdom here on earth together.